Well, a good evening and a warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening for our midweek devotion. Uh, if you are joining us for the first time um, at Northside, we are going through a series on the book of Amos. And every Wednesday, we have a midweek devotion gleaning from the same passage we would have preached through, just taking a different angle or making some elaborations on the things that would have been mentioned. And so today we are looking at a passage from Amos chapter 7 and verses 10 to verse 17. Uh, this is a continuation from uh, the message that had been preached. Uh, it is a section which carries five visions that Amos was given by the Lord, and this is marked by the phrase, this is what the Lord has shown me, uh, showed me. And you find that in chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 7, verse uh, 3, chapter 7, uh, and verse 7. And these were the three visions that Pastor Gary looked at uh, last week. Uh, and so this last Sunday, we looked at uh, uh, the, 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 the passage that we are going to read today. Uh, and so this section of five visions, we have already looked at the three. And this is an interlude which is in between, which is, has been caused by what has been said before through the three visions. The first vision was the vision of the locusts that were coming to devour the land of Israel. And we also had the, 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 the fire that was also uh, shown to Amos that was going to destroy uh, Israel. And Amos, in, in the two visions, pleads with God. And he cries out and says, Lord, would you relent from doing this? Because Jacob cannot, um, cannot be able to carry this. He's too small. And in both cases, the Lord relented. And then the third vision was the plumb line, where God says, I'm coming to measure up everybody. And those who are found wanting are going to be destroyed. And he says, this they cannot escape. And because of that message of the plumb line, we see it stirring in the a priest Amazia, some sense of resentment towards the prophet who is pronouncing a judgment on him, um, not only on him, but also on the king and the kingdom. And so uh, we have this interlude from verse 10, which says, Then Amazia, the priest of uh, Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all these, his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, now turning to the prophet, he says, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from, the tending, from tending the, she, the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now then hear the word of the Lord, you prophet, you priest. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the descendants of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up, and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. And so from this passage we saw that the priest and the prophet were at loggerheads. Why? Because the prophet had done his work. He had been called by God to go and speak to Israel. And Israel had been warned. And the warnings, they were not, you know, warnings to just be sounded to tell them of what was going to happen. But it was also meant for them to repent. Because in chapter 5, we hear God saying, seek the Lord and you live. Seek to do that which is good and you will live. And therefore, it was a message of both judgment and hope in the sense that if they would continue in their sin, they would be judged. But if they would repent, they would be saved. Now, as we come into this chapter, the prophet and the priest were both in the service of God. The prophet being the middleman between God and men, he being the mouthpiece of God to men, whilst the priest was standing on behalf of men to bring people toward God. And now we hear the language is different. Whilst the priest the prophet had proclaimed what God was saying. Instead of the priest 
siding with him to develop that thought, he actually goes against the prophet. And so how does he do that? He sends a report to the king saying, King, here, this is what is happening. There is a prophet called Amos from the southern Judah who has come into Israel and is proclaiming judgment against you. And he gives the message and says, this is the message. This, first, is, this, is, these are his actions. His actions are he's conspiring, he's plotting an evil thing against you, the king, and the kingdom. But the second thing, he is giving a message and saying, you, King Jeroboam, you will die by the sword and Israel will go into captivity. From this we see the response from the prophet was, he says, here I stand, I will not budge, I will not go back to my land because God called me here. And in humility he says, I have not been a prophet, I don't, you know, I didn't, I'm not even a son of a prophet, neither did I even aspire to be one, but I was a tender of, or a shepherd of the sheep. And God took me from the sheep. I was also attending to sycamore fig trees. But God took me and says, go and prophesy. And because for that reason, I will prophesy. And we remember him saying, the, the lion has roared. Who shall not fear? The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? So he's saying, I cannot keep quiet. And he says, and he says this after this, he pronounces judgments that are coming because of the opposition that he had gone through. Now, today what I just want to do is to give us a, a, at least three things that are truths that we can glean from this passage. The first one is that testings are inevitable. In fact, testings are inevitably unavoidable for all believers. If you are a believer, you will be tested. You will be tempted. You will go through uh, opposition. You will be persecuted for your faith. That is inevitable. It is going to happen. Many people these days preach and say, if you are a Christian, all your cares and burdens and all the harsh things in life will go away. That is not true. We see here a man of God, as they say it in the world today, that those who are called to pastoral ministry, to prophecy and all that are called men of God. Anyway, that is not even true because everyone is a man and a woman of God if we believe on Jesus Christ. But the truth of the matter is, if we have believed, we will be tested, we will be tempted because this is unavoidable. It is inevitably unavoidable for us to be tested. There is no Christian service without opposition, without persecution, and without trial. And we see here the prophet, uh, the prophet Amos being tested in three ways. The first test was that there was a misrepresentation of facts. You know, when Amos, when Amaziah reported to the king, he misrepresented facts in the sense that he only pronounced the judgment towards the king in Israel as a report to the king, but the, there was more that Amos had done. There was more that Amos had said that the priest didn't say. For example, he didn't mention about the message of hope that if they seek the Lord, they would be spared. He also didn't mention the fact that um, God was punishing them because of his love for them, his con unconditional love, his election privilege uh, that he had given them was the cause for that. He did not mention the things that were that were important. He just mentioned the things that he wanted to mention to stir anger from the king so that he can come against, uh, uh, against the prophet. So we see a misrepresentation of facts, one, the first test. But the second one, when he, he, he turns and confronts the, uh, the prophet, he says to the prophet, go, flee, go back to your land, Judah, and prophesy there and make a living. What he's saying there, he's saying, I'm giving you a better option. The king will come after you. That's the first one. But the second choice you have is to just go away. It sounds good, isn't it? You are going through, you know, you're a Christian, you are going through opposition and, and all that, and an escape route is just walk away and you will be fine. So he comes here with a temptation to seek to save himself, to take the, the option that is simpler and easier route to take. But we know what we know is that the prophet stood his ground. And even in your service as a Christian, there will come a time when the test comes as an enticing test. The first one was a misrepresentation of facts, which the devil has always used to want to woodwink us into thinking that God was mistaken in saying or doing certain things. But also, then it can come with enticing words saying, oh, if you just do this, you are okay. 
and then to seeking to gratify yourself, go with it. And many have laid into temptation. You know, these days people talk about you Christians, um, bigots and all that. Uh, but if you just be inclusive, just allow other people. In fact, it's your life, it's their life. Just let them be. You know, those easier options. But also the test came as a confrontation. A confrontation with authority. There are things that we believe as, as, as a faith community that can actually go against the authorities that be. And then there's a temptation to be confronted by the authorities. And we see here that the prophet was confronted by authority. The priest who said, I'm serving the king. I'm serving, working in the king's sanctuary. Uh, and he comes and says, this is the temple of the kingdom. I'm working for the kingdom, for the king. And so you go. Therefore, there is that confrontation with authority. It also comes with the package of being a Christian because there are certain values that we hold on to as Christians, as believers, trusting God for them that the world doesn't ascribe to and therefore the world will come for us. And remember this, that even the word of God tells us that this will happen. And we have good examples of people who went through this. I remember when Peter uh, and the other apostles were brought before uh, the council and they were told, commanded not to speak in the name of Jesus in all Jerusalem. And Peter replied and said, we must obey God than men, if you read Acts chapter 5, 29. We must obey God than men. This is what we see the prophet doing. He is saying, I will not, even if you oppose me, even if you persecute me for my faith, I will stand for God and not for men. And then the second thing, so the first thing we saw is that test, Testings are inevitably unavoidable. And the second one is true believers rest upon divine obedience. Amos has authority from God to go and preach, and therefore he does. Because he is to obey God rather than to obey men. He rests on divine authority for his obedience. The Lord said to me, is his statement, the Lord said to me, and he's saying, this is not me. You're looking at me, seeing me. I'm just a vessel. But the Lord has said. And I wish that all preachers and all teachers of God's word would just persistently say the Lord said. Because it is the Lord. And if it is the Lord, then no one else can dispute that because the Lord has said. As long as we are speaking the truth that the Lord has said it, then it stands. And this must be said and done in all circumstances. We see in Philippians chapter 129, it is, it is categorically stated that it was not only granted for us believers to believe, but also to suffer for his name's sake. And the sufferings comes, come in many, uh, in, in many forms and shades. Sometimes it is health, sometimes it's, it's still suffering, as long as it brings God glory, like Paul had a thorn in his flesh which glorified God because it buffeted him and kept him in check. It can come as persecution from the outside world. It can be anything, as long as we suffer rightly for the cause of Christ. And the third thing is that true believers stand. We see the prophet standing and saying, here I stand. I can do no other. Help me, so help me God, like Martin Luther said. This is what believers should do. Whilst it is true that testings are inevitable, whilst it, it is true that believers um, will be persecuted, believers need to stand on, on divine obedience because of the authority that they've been given to serve, but also believers need to stand firm. As we look at this passage, you can see that the word divides. So God gives the word, and the word is spoken by the prophet. To other people, it leads them to repentance, but to others, it leads them to anger and even to persecute others. We see Amaziah, when he looked at this word, he didn't see it as a word of hope. He saw only the judgments and therefore was infuriated. But on the other hand, if you look at the Ninevites, the same word about repentance which was preached by the, apostle, uh, the prophet Jonah, the same way Amos was preaching it, the Ninevites repented. So that is why the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, but for those who are perishing, it is foolishness. The question is, where do you stand? Do you stand with the gospel as the power of God unto salvation, or is it foolishness to you? But we know that on our own we can do nothing. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ says. And therefore, God gives the graces for believers to stand. He gives the believers the graces to 
rest upon his divine, divine obedience. It takes God to help the believer to resist the testings. And therefore, I call upon you today, aid first for you to make the right choice and follow God in all circumstances, to stand for him, rest upon him. That is trust. When we trust him in the, on the mountaintops and trust him on the, in the valleys, that is trust, relying on him even when you stand against persecution and trials and tribulations that come because of our faith. But secondly, we need to rest upon him. When we have chosen him, we rest upon him that his spirit leads and guides us so that we can overcome the temptations of the world. Remember, Jesus says, I have overcome the world, and therefore we have become overcomers because he is an overcomer, for we are his followers if we indeed follow him. I want to thank the Lord for you today. We have, uh, we have taken your time to uh, join us in this devotion. My prayer is that this word will not go back to God void, as he promised that it will not do that, either it will accomplish something in your heart or it will accomplish something through God judging you for not taking use of it when he has given it out to you. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord be on your side and you on his side. May you not be found wanting like the, the, the priest Amazia. May you not fight for the kingdom of darkness, but fight for the kingdom of heaven, for those things that are put before us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you that you remind us of our sins. Just like the Israelites, we are also sinners, saved by grace, and therefore should be kept by grace. Keep us. As we go through trials and tribulations for our faith, give us strength. Empower us to be bold and to rest on your obedience. All this, Lord, we commit to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Uh, until we meet again, bye-bye for now.